our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great.
love. It was his love. We celebrate the love of Jesus. We honor the love of God. And we love him because he first loved us. We praise him because he first loved us. He is worthy of all adoration. He is worthy of all glory. He is worthy of all honor. Today, we glorify the matchless King. We glorify the one who sits on the throne of heaven. Hallelujah. Who loved us enough to rescue us by God. Hallelujah. Thank God for his love. And it's in that love that we live, we move, and we have our being. And sometimes we don't always understand the magnitude of how much he really loves us. We don't perceive the depth of his love towards us. My God, if we only knew, we would run to his presence. We would run to the altar. We would run and surrender our hearts. We would run and we would give him everything. We would, we would not hold anything back if we realized the depth of his love. And today, we're encouraged because the Lord loved us. Love you, Jesus. The Lord graced us and the Lord favored us one more time to allow us to be in the house of God. Anybody grateful for just one more time? Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on. Anybody grateful for just one more time? Glory to God. Give it to me. One thing have I desired, and that what I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord to inquire in his temple. I'm grateful for just one more time. It didn't have to be this way. Glory to God have to be this way, but the Lord saw fit to give us another chance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, now, there is some, there is, there is some uh, people that understand when I say one more time, uh, you understand that God didn't even have to allow you to have another chance to see and in the midst of everything that we are in, uh, COVID-19 is still out here. And they say that South Carolina is a hot spot. They say that um, there are going to be more deaths. There's going to be more sickness, more people hooked up to ventilators. And you mean to tell me that you got a casual praise for the fact that God allowed you to be in the house one more time? I thought somebody might have hollered. I thought somebody might have reared back and screamed and said, Lord, I thank you for one more time. Come on, somebody. Oh, I thank you for one more time. Hallelujah. Holy to your name. Thank you for doing it one more time. Woo. Thank you for rescuing me one more time. Thank you for keeping me one more time. Thank you for the one 
enemy wants you to look everywhere except where you need to look. Oh, God, this is what I heard. That's what I heard the Holy Ghost say. The enemy wants you to look everywhere except look up. My God, for some of you, he's trying to get you to look back. Look back at your past. Look back at what happened. Look back at your mistake. And you can't get the victory because you're too busy looking back. For somebody else, the reason why you can't reach breakthrough is because you're too busy looking around. Oh my. You're looking around at other folk. You're looking around at how the situation looks. You're looking around at all the wrong stuff. Woo! But if you would ever learn to look up, somebody say, look.
I am favored and flawed. I'm favored and flawed. And thank God that although we have many different areas in our life that the Lord is still working on, that He still blesses us, He still loves us, and He still keeps us. And to understand the paradox of being favored and flawed, being blessed while you are still a mess in certain areas, it causes you to appreciate God and it causes you to want to, how can I say this? It causes you to want to gravitate towards your wholeness. It causes you to want to gravitate towards being better. Because in the midst of me not loving him perfectly, he still loved me perfectly. Still loves me. My God. In the midst of me not being as faithful as I could have been, he's still faithful towards me. In the midst of my brokenness, he did not deal with me according to what I deserved. But he dealt with me according to his love. And so we understand that we are favored and flawed. And today we're going to look at the life of David. We're going to look at the life of David. And the Lord is going to speak to us. And I can give you a thought for the message. It would be, I'm anointed in spite of my issues. Yes, I am. I'm anointed in spite of my issues. I want to talk to some anointed people today. I want to talk to some gifted people today. I want to talk to those that the Lord's hand is on your life. And we're going into the word of God. And I want you to turn with me. We're looking at the life of David. And you know how I've been preaching this series. I've been preaching this particular series a little bit different. It's not a scripture in three points. It's not your traditional style of delivering the message, but I want to take you through the journey on a journey of the life of David. Will y'all go with me on today? I want you to go with me, and I want you to see when God had made up in his mind that he was going to anoint David was before David even knew that the call of God was on his life. Can we go there? Let's go to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13, and we're going to look at the 13th and the 14th verse as we journey through the life of David. Here is the story of where God calls to himself a new king. Here the scripture reads as such, Samuel talking, he says, how foolish, Samuel exclaimed, he says, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Listen to that verse. But now your kingdom must end. He's talking to Saul. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Pause right there. So, so we come into the story and before we even get introduced to the life of of David, before we get introduced to his story, to his history, we understand that God had chosen to end the reign of Saul, who was Israel's king, and God had anointed, and he had chosen a man that he called to himself, and the funny thing about it is that God found him uh, before he was even looking for anything from God. Mm, glory to God. And, and God chose him before he even had an intention or an aspiration. Can I preach to somebody on today? Is that God had you on his mind before you even knew the fullness of who you would be. 
he had you on his mind before you understood what you were carrying, before you knew uh, even your gift, even your skill set. He had you on your on his mind before you even knew that he was going to use you, that he was going to anoint you. And so God says something interesting to Samuel. He said that this time, I know that you were the people's choice. See, Saul was the people's choice, but he says that the next king is going to be my choice. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, the next king is going to be my choice. And it is interesting to note that although you may not be people's first choice, you may not be people's first option, I'd rather be the first option in the heart of God than the first option in the heart of man. Come on, somebody. I'd rather be on God's radar than be on your radar of popularity or who you think is somebody. And here David was doing what he was doing, serving his father as a shepherd boy. And in the midst of him serving, God chose him. And God chose him because he saw something about the characteristic of his heart. He saw something about the characteristic of his heart and, and and so Saul found himself, he was rejected. He was, he was disobedient to God uh, so often that God said that I must anoint another who will have my heart. Thank God for his people, those of us that have the heart of God. There's something to be said of those who share the heart of God. And in order to share the heart of God, you've got to walk with him. In order to share the heart of God, you've got to know his ways. In order to share the heart of God, you've got to know his character. You've got to know what he loves. And, and you've got to understand what he hates. And you've got to understand his likes, you got to understand his dislikes. And the problem with a lot of us, uh, uh, the reason why we don't always have the heart of God is because we have not got close enough to him to hear his heartbeat. Mm, who am I preaching to in here? We've not got close enough to him to really hear how his heart beats, to know what it is that he desires, to know what it is that he loves. And so we're going to look at now, we're going to look at the anointing of David because being anointed is not easy. Uh -huh. Being anointed is not easy. Uh, the, the, having God's hand on your life is not just a walk in the park. And I want to, un, I want to unfold this to you so you would understand uh, what, what it means to be anointed. And so we, we skip over now to 1 Samuel 16. We will concentrate on the 8th through the 13th verse. And we look at 1 Samuel 16, 8 through 13. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And it says this, and it says, And then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, This is not the one the Lord has chosen. And next, Jesse summoned Shemiah. But Samuel said, Neither is this the one the Lord has chosen? And in the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? And he said, there is still the youngest, the eighth son, the eighth son. Jesse replied, but he is out in the field watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him and he was dark and he was handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. And so David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of olive oil and he had brought and, uh, that he had brought and he anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. 
to Ramah. And so we, we, we look in the next portion of the narrative of David in the story and the history of David. And we find out the way that he was anointed. The way that he was anointed uh, is somewhat unusual because Samuel the prophet comes to Jesse's house. And God leads him to Jesse and he speaks and he says, I want you to go down to a man named Jesse's house and you are going to anoint one of his sons who is going to be the next king of Israel. Yes. And he doesn't, he doesn't let him know what his name is, but he says that when you are in front of him, I am going to let you know the one that I have called you to anoint. And so naturally, Jesse, uh, when he presents his sons to Samuel, he presents the one that he thinks are most capable and that would be most suitable to be king. Come on, somebody. And so he brings up his first son, probably the strongest one, probably the oldest one, probably the one that he favored. And Samuel goes and he begins to look and say, is this the one? And the Lord says, no, not so. And he begins to bring uh, seven of his sons before the prophet and the prophet is looking around saying listen ain't none of these the one uh, I know they might be they might be good boys they might be uh, men trained in warfare they might be soldiers but these are not the one and he said Jesse do you have any more sons and Jesse is like listen I still got one but He's out, he's the youngest, and he's out tending to the sheep and the goats. He is nothing but a shepherd boy. Uh, I don't think that he's the one that you came for. Uh, but the prophet says, you know what? Go get him at once. We will not sit down. We ain't going to rest until he comes before me in my presence. Uh, and we find out that David uh, was the one who was oftentimes overlooked. See, uh, I'm going to talk to some people uh, that are really anointed, but sometimes uh, you have been looking for people to validate. You have been looking for people to recognize uh, what is on your life. You have been looking for people to uh, even substantiate what God has told you. And I came to let you know that sometimes when you are really anointed, uh, uh, people in your circle will sometimes be the last ones to see it. Sometimes people will be the last ones to affirm it because uh, they want to look at your past. They want to look at where you come from. They want to look at your mistakes and say there's no way that God can use somebody like that. Hallelujah. But you can't, you can't wait till you receive the go-ahead from people when God is showing you what he really placed in you. Mm, glory to God. And so here comes David. David comes before him and he begins and the Lord speaks and he said, this is the one. And he pours out the oil upon David's head. And David, we, we fast forward in the narrative of David and we, we look at it and we consider how great David was. I want to let you know how great David was because oftentimes we focus on the victories of the people in the Bible. We focus on their, their strength. We focus on the times that they won. We focus on the times where they accomplished great things. We focus on all of the things until the point where we, we, we almost make them beyond human. But I want to draw out today that although David was great, there were some areas that God uh, was working on him in his life. I want to talk to you today about being anointed in spite of your issues because you can be anointed uh, and still God has to deal with uh, and process you through some stuff. You can be anointed and you can be called and God still has to work some things out of you and work some things into you before you can become. Uh, before you can become. And what I love about David is although he was anointed, uh, he did not rush to his position but he sat and he waited and he allowed himself to mature and be trained before he was uh, able to receive uh, the, the, the position that came with the anointing. Oh yeah, because you can be anointed and you can move into position too soon. Uh, what I love about David is that he got anointed by God, but he didn't walk around with a big head in the title saying that I am the Lord's anointed. He didn't walk around and start treating folk differently because he had an anointing on his life. As a matter of fact, after David was anointed, he went right back into the field and kept on serving his father. And the problem with some of us is that when we get anointed by God, 
God, we forget how to serve. When we get anointed by God, we lose the attitude of a servant. We lose the mindset that God, I know that you've anointed me for something great, but don't ever let me forget how to serve. I gotta, I wanna, I wanna have the type of anointing that allows me to preach the word and still sweep the floor. I wanna have the type of anointing that allows me to sing the solo and still clean the bathroom. I wanna have the type of anointing that allows people to know my name, but it, but in order it allows me to be in the presence of people and still serve them like I'm nobody. Come on, somebody. I wanna have that type of anointing like David, who understood that although I'm anointed, I know that where my help comes from. And so David was so great. We consider how great David was. David was the one who wrote at least half of the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. 150 Psalms. And David penned at least, uh, there's 74 known Psalms of David. There are 49 uh, anonymous Psalms. Uh, some of those also probably written by David. And he wrote, uh, he wrote at least over half of the Psalms of worship and the Psalms of, of prophetic writings. We understand that David was the one who slew the giant. Y'all remember the story uh, from Bible school? Y'all remember the time when we learned about how David defeated the giant named Goliath. He defeated uh, the Philistine champion, the Philistine champion, and he slayed Goliath. And he made a name for himself because of the giant that he slayed. We understand that David was the second king of Israel. He was the second king of Israel after Saul. We understand that David was a great military leader and he led Israel in victory over every enemy of God. There wasn't a place that David went where he did not conquer and have victory. Consider how great he was. David was the only king in which that the, that the kingdom of Israel was stayed united. All of the other kings, the kingdom was the divided, it was separated, but in David's life, he reigned under a united kingdom of Israel and Judah. And we must understand that David was even a pioneer in worship. He was a worshiper on a different level. Uh, some people were, were gifted, but David's worship was on another playing field. David's worship, uh, the way that he worshiped God, it had never been seen before. The way that he exalted God had never been done before. And so David, we understand that he was a skilled musician. Yes, he was. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that he did is he played for King Saul. And it was nobody, but all, nobody could sue Saul when he was under torment. When he was in the place of being under uh, extreme anxiety, uh, only when only David's playing could soothe the spirit that tormented Saul. And so he was a skilled musician. He was gifted. He was a gifted songwriter in order to pen the great Psalms, like Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Come on, the things that we quote are uh, uh, Psalms 24. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Oh, uh, come on, all of the Psalms that we read, Psalm 63, oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. He wrote all of these things. Uh, he was a gifted songwriter and a musical called genius. Hallelujah. He also is prophesied. I want to let you know about David. He was prophesied to be the anointed prince of the future kingdom of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is. David is prophesied to be a, a prince to reign on the throne beside Jesus Christ in the millennial kingdom. No other person has this honor. No other person was given this esteem. But more than anything, more than anything else, the thing that is attributed to David that made him greater than what we have, what we know, what we have seen in the Bible is that God referred to him. He is the only one that is referred to as a man after God's own heart. Right. Come on, somebody. He is a man after God's own heart. God said, I will choose a king. 
And this time, I will choose a man that is after my own heart. What does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? It seems like a contradiction when we consider the rest of the life of David, when we consider some of the things that he went through, when we consider some of the things that he did, but I hope to, I hope to make it plain to you today, I hope to reveal it to you on today, what it truly means to be a man or a woman after God's own heart. So we yeah. fast forward in the narrative, now that we've looked at how great David was and how great he, how great he, he actually, his history and his track record was, I want you to go with me to 2 Samuel 6 where we're going to pick up from verse 5 through 10 in 2 Samuel 6 because I want to show you a story about David. I want to show you uh, what it looks like to be anointed. And in 2 Samuel 6 verses 5 through 10 we read about the story yeah. where David Glory. where David is trying to move the ark of the Lord yes. back to the capital city. Tell the story. He wants to move the ark of the Lord back to the house of David, back to the place where the tabernacle was. And so we pick it up in 2 Samuel 6, 5 through 10, and it says this, and it says, and David and all the people of Israel were celebrating before the Lord, and they were singing songs and playing all kinds of musical instruments the lyres and the harps and the tambourines and the castanets and the cymbals. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. And the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah. Go ahead now. And God struck him dead because of this. And so Uzzah died right there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. And he named the place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah. And as it is called today, and David was now afraid of the Lord. And he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of the Lord back into my care? So David decided not to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. Mm, glory to God. So I need you to understand this because uh, what I want to, what, what the Holy Spirit began to illuminate to me in this particular season is that just because you are anointed doesn't mean that you weren't experienced failure at times. Come on, that's for somebody. Uh, I want to talk to the anointed folk in the room. I want to talk to the people that God has his hands on. Uh, because uh, here was David. He wanted to do something positive. He wanted to do something good. He wanted to bring the ark of the Lord. Look at him. He wanted to bring the ark which represents the presence of God. Which represents the power of God. Which is a symbol of God's goodness. It's a symbol of, of God being with the people. And here I am. God and I want to do something good for you and he assembles the worshipers and he assembles the singers and he puts this grand plan together and how he is going to move the ark of the Lord back to the house of David and in the midst of it here he is praising and here he is worshiping and here are the people dancing but something happens something goes wrong in the midst of the praise something goes wrong in the midst of the worship, something goes wrong in the midst of David trying to do something good. I want to preach to somebody. Yeah. Have you ever been trying to do something positive, something good? Have you ever been trying to push your business? Have you ever been trying to step forward in your gift? Have you ever been trying oh, to step out in faith? Have you ever tried something only to find out? that when you step out and try it, that it miserably failed. I want to let somebody know uh, that even though you are anointed, it does not 
God exempts you from certain things going wrong. You can be anointed and still experience disappointment. Uh huh. You can be anointed and still experience people uh, walking out on you. You can be anointed and your plan fail. Oh, glory to God. And so David comes to a place where he is anointed and he assumes that because he is anointed that what he is aspiring to do is going to automatically succeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What he's going to do for God is going to automatically succeed. Uh, but he gets frustrated uh, because of the fact that as they are moving the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, it begins to stumble and it begins to fall and Uzzah places his hand to stable the Ark. And what we must understand is that because he touched the holy thing, uh, God's presence was so powerful. God's presence was so holy that he died right there on the spot and so David begins to get discouraged uh, because he feels like God embarrassed him oh glory he feels like God embarrassed him he feels like uh, here I am the king uh, and I said that we were going to move the ark uh, and I said this is what we were going to do uh, but Lord you allowed me to fail in the face of people oh glory to God and one of the strategies of the enemy sometimes uh, is to cause you uh, to feel like a failure in the midst of in the midst of people that are onlookers, and so David gets discouraged and he says, "You know what? The ark can stay right where it's at. I was trying to move it. I was trying to do what I thought I heard the Lord say, but because the Lord embarrassed me, I'm gonna let it sit right where it is. Glory to God. Is there anybody who felt that way about the calling of the Lord on your life? I'm gonna let it." sit right where it is. Yeah, I heard your call, but I'm going to let it sit right where it is. I heard you. I heard you give me instructions, but because I, got, I, I put my faith out there for people to see, I'm going to let it sit right where it is. Yeah, I, I announced the engagement, but I'm going to let it sit right where it is. God, oh my God, I said I was a, I said that this was a season I was going to preach, but Lord, because you let me lose everything, I'm going to let it sit right where it is. Glory to God. I know I'm preaching to somebody in here that, that, that felt like leaving it sh sitting right where it is. You didn't want to pick it back up again. You said, I'll never do it again. I'll never sing again. I'll never preach again. I'll never step out again. I'll never love again. Come on, somebody. And this was a place that David found himself. Oh, but here at the end of the story, the Ark of the Covenant was left at the house of a man named Obed Edom. And the Bible says that the Lord began to bless and favor Obed Edom so that increase began to swell up to him and his whole family. I'm talking about blessing on top of blessing. And, and David was looking and he heard reports of what was going on at Obed Edom's house. And sometimes the Lord will provoke you back into your place. Woo! Hallelujah. Sometimes God you got to sit back and watch other folk get blessed. You got to sit back and watch other people write the book. You got to sit back and watch other people go forward in the idea that God gave you first. Oh, sometimes the Lord will provoke you back into your calling, back into your place. And so David is looking at what's going on at Obed Edom's house. And I believe he's looking, but he don't want to look. I believe he's glancing, but he really don't want to is the truth. I believe he sees a blessing, but he's like, uh, I don't need it. Uh, I don't want it. That's okay. Let it be blessed. But finally, he comes to a place where he says, Lord, if I can just try it again. Come on, somebody. I came to preach to about five of you and say the Lord is getting ready to give you back a try in your spirit. The Lord is getting ready to give you back that unction in your belly that's going to cause you to try again. in my 
my spirit. And the Lord is asking you, can you bounce back from the failure? Can you bounce back from the regret? Can you bounce back by what went wrong? Can you bounce back and praise me again? Can you bounce back and worship me again? Can you bounce back and serve me again? Can you bounce back and try again? And so David gets provoked by what God was doing. And something causes him to try again. Oh, glory to God. And this time, this time, he understood where he messed up because the ox, the, the Ark of the Covenant was never supposed to be carried on an oxen. Mm. Uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant was never supposed to be carried on the back of oxen. It was supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the Levitical priesthood uh, because what you're carrying, the glory that you're carrying, uh, sometimes you can't carry it the right way in unstable places. You can't carry the glory that's on your life uh, when things in your life are unstable. Woo, hallelujah. And I hear the Lord say, David, I couldn't let the glory be carried while you were still in an unstable place. But first I had to stabilize you. And I had to stabilize some things in your life so that you can carry the glory that I call to rest on you. He's stabilizing some stuff in me. He's stabilizing some stuff in my family. He's stabilizing some stuff in my mind. He's stabilizing some stuff in my spirit so that I can carry what he called me to carry. Can I move forward? Can we move forward? So David is an anointed man, but he, got to, he has to bounce back from some failures in his life. And I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but you've experienced some letdowns. You've experienced some failures. You've experienced some things. But I hear the Lord saying that now is your time to bounce back. Yes, Lord. Oh, Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now I want to look at... I want to look at 1 Chronicles 21 because I want to show you another, another narrative in, in David's life. Another season in the life of David. 1 Chronicles 21. 1 through 4. See, we talk about the victories. We talk about the slaying of the giants. We talk about the anointing to be king. But I want to let you know that sometimes David wrestled with some things. First Chronicles 21, 1 through 4. Listen to this. And it says, Satan rose up against Israel and he caused David to take a census of the people of Israel. So David said to Joab, the commander of the army, take a census of all the people of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so that I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, look at this, may the Lord increase the number of his people a hundred times over, but why, my Lord the king, do you want to do this? Are they not all your servants? Why must you cause Israel to sin? But the king insisted that they take the census. So Joab traveled throughout all of Israel to count the people. And then he returned to Jerusalem. Oh, God, help me to, help me to unfold this. Because right now, some of you are hearing this and you're like, what, 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 what happened? What just happened? Why, why was that so bad? Why, what actually happened? And so David, uh, in order to understand this, that David took the census, it's going to make sense in a minute. Because uh, in order for a king to take a census, it was him measuring the strength of his kingdom. It was a measuring the strength of his ability. It was a measuring of, of, of what he thought he had. And in order to understand it, you've got to go to Exodus 30, chapter 11 through 15, because I'm going to show you a revelation. And when you go to Exodus 30, it's going to make sense. And so in Exodus 30, verses 11 through 15, watch this. And the Lord said to Moses, whenever you take a census of the people of Israel, each man who is counted must pay a ransom for himself to the Lord. 
Then no plague will strike the people as you count them. Mm, here it is. So the Lord said, I don't really want you to count your numbers. I don't really want you to count what you think you have because if you get tempted to count what you think that you have, you're going to stop trusting in me. But he says, if you do take a census, each person has got to give a sacrificial ransom to cover their life. Uh-oh, here it is. He says, then no plague will strike the people as you count them. And each person who is counted must give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. The payment is half a shekel based on the sanctuary shekel, which is equal to 20 garrets. And all who have reached their 20th birthday must give the sacred offering to the Lord. And when this offering is given to the Lord to purify your lives, making you right with him, the rich must not give more than the specified amount, and the poor must not give less. So here, here is the revelation. In order for David to take the census, he was going, in order for him to do it, he was going to have to demand that every single person over 20 years old was going to have to present a sacrifice so that destruction didn't come on the land. And the temptation is, when he took the census, he did not require what the Lord told him was required. Uh-oh. Here it is. And so one of the temptations of anointed people is they got to be careful that they don't get lifted up in the numbers. Uh -oh. oh my God. Anointed folk got to get the, got to be careful that they don't get lifted up and look how many people, look how many people know my name. Oh, they got to get, they got to be careful and look how many people shout when I sing. Look how many people, look how many people come when I preach. Look how many people, oh, respond to the anointing that is on my life. And if you're anointed, you got to be careful not to be moved by the applause of people. You got to be careful that you don't begin to look at the numbers. You can get caught up in the Facebook likes. You can get caught up in the Instagram follows. You can get caught up in those who look like they are for you and understand that that's not what makes your anointing. And anointed people, they must be careful uh, to be tempted uh, to think that the rules don't no longer apply to them. Uh, yeah, I said that. Uh, anointed people have a tendency uh, of thinking that the rules don't apply to them. Uh, they got a tendency to get confident in their anointing uh, and then no longer think that I got to watch my life. Uh, yeah, I'm anointed and I ain't got to pray like I used to. Uh, I don't got to pass like I used to. Uh, I don't have to do everything that the Lord said. Uh, anointed people got to be careful because anointed folk uh, can get overconfident and cocky. Uh, but I want to be anointed in such a way uh, that I never rely on the strength of the numbers. Uh, that I never rely on the applaud of the people. That I never rely on the strength of my gift. Uh, but I remain at the foot of Jesus. Uh, that I remain at the foot of the cross. Uh, that I no longer rely on the applaud of the people. But I understand that everything that I am is because God made me who I am. Glory to God. Anointed folk sometimes can be tempted to believe that they are above judgment. Go ahead now. Mm. And so here it is, is why we've got a lot of mixed up stuff in the church. Because, watch this, because we were anointed to sing, we were anointed to play, and we were anointed to preach. Uh, and, 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 we begin sometimes to do things outside of the will of God. Yes. yes. And we still jumped on the microphone and it still moved the people. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, we still prophesied and it was still accurate. Yes. We still jumped on the keyboard and it was still, and the people still shouted, don't let your anointing uh, fool you into thinking that you are exempt from the judgment of God. And as a result, hear me, hear me, hear me in the Holy Ghost. Uh, because sometimes uh, anointed folk uh, have the tendency of thinking that because I can still do the thing, uh, it means that God is still with me. Because I can still operate, it means that God is still walking with me. Because I can still move a crowd, it means that I'm still in the place that God is pleased with. Uh, but you got to understand that day that God checked David. 
And he said, because you took the census of the people and you began to rely on yourself, 70,000 men are going to fall dead because you didn't do what I told you to do. Can I put a disclaimer and a warning out to anointed folk? Sometimes because you're anointed, when you get out of place, it's not only affecting you, but it's affecting those that are connected to you. And sometimes you got to understand that I got to remain before the Lord because my anointing is not just about me, but it's about everybody that's connected to me. Sometimes you've been anointed for your family. You've been anointed for your church. You've been anointed for your job. You've been anointed for many different things. And you can't play with it because it's bigger than you. That's right. Yes. Mm. Who am I preaching to in here yes, today? Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm. Anointed folk. Hallelujah. I want to bring you uh, to one more, one more passage of David's life, and then we're going to be ready to go home. Hallelujah. In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verses 1 through 4, we look at another season and another time in the life of David. And the word of the Lord reads, and it says, In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war. That's going to be significant. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. And they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. And late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And he looked out over the city. Tell the story. And he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. And he sent someone to find out who she was. Hey, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And then David sent messengers to get her. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. And she had just completed her purification rites. Glory to God. That's enough right there. And so, and so we peek into we peek into a period of David's life, which was probably uh, the biggest scandal of his life. It was probably the biggest fall of his life. It was probably the biggest mistake that he had ever made. And so we understand that you can be anointed. Hear me good. You can be anointed and still have issues in your flesh. You can be anointed and still have some things that if you're not careful, that the enemy is right there ready to pull you back into. Am I talking to any anointed folk? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Don't ever think that you uh, become so anointed that you're exempt from temptation. Don't ever think that you're so anointed that you don't have to watch your spirit. Don't ever think that you're so anointed that you can stop praying and that you can stop fasting and you can stop seeking God. Oh, glory to God. And here David was and David found himself in a compromised position. He found himself in a scandal. He found himself in a place that he did not want to go because he got caught in a vulnerable spot. Mm, glory to God. And what we must understand is that when you are not in the midst of your assignment is when you are most vulnerable. Can I say that for somebody? Uh, one of the reasons why the enemy tries to get you out of your assignment is because when you are not in your assignment, that's when you're most vulnerable. Hallelujah. And so David is said at the time where the kings usually are going out to war, David began to relax and he stayed home. And so he sent other folk out to go to battle while he stayed back in the comfortable palace. And you got to understand the reason why you've got to stay submerged in the house of God. The reason why you've got to stay submerged in your assignment. The reason why you've got to engulf yourself 
in the thing that God called you to is because whenever you get out of your assignment, that's when the greatest distractions take place. Whenever you get separated from your assignment, that's when the enemy begins to come in. And uh, the old folks used to say that an idle mind, it, it becomes a devil's workshop. Uh -huh. And this is why you got to keep your mind on Jesus all the time. Because when I begin to let it wander, hallelujah, uh, you can feel mighty saved on Sunday. Oh, uh, become Thursday, you got some dirty stuff on your mind. Somebody say, Lord, help me to keep my mind on Jesus. Help me to stay plugged into my assignment. Because I realize that my anointing can't save me from a fall. And so the devil's deception is, the devil's deception is to anointed folk. It's because I'm anointed, I no longer have to fight. <laughs> mm. Go ahead now. Because I'm anointed, I no longer have to fight. Uh, yeah, David had to fight for everything that he had. He had to fight. He had to fight to get validation from his father. He had to fight to be recognized. He had to, be, he had to fight Goliath in order to be recognized as a great man of war. He had to fight as Saul chased him. He had to fight to maintain his position as king. And he had fought so long that sometimes the temptation of anointed folk is to begin to lay down the fight that God put in you. Oh yeah. Mm, glory it. to God. To lay down the fight that God put in you. And, and, and after a while, uh, I, I, what I really believe that killed the fight in David is that he no longer had Jonathan to confide in. Oh, Go ahead now. oh my. That's yeah, right. because you understand that Jonathan was killed in battle, and, and, and David and Jonathan had that kind of relationship. Right. And, and sometimes it can be a disappointment that happened that killed the fight that was in you. It can be something that broke you to a point where you no longer feel like the fight. Is there anybody that's been anointed uh, and you no longer feel like the fight? You no longer feel like wrestling with, uh, uh, with, with causing people to understand who you are? You no longer feel... Oh, uh, like fighting anymore with trying to fight against the temptation. You no longer feel like fighting with some stuff in your life. Glory to God. Don't let the enemy take your fight in a season where you need, hallelujah, the strength of God. Don't let the enemy take your fight because if he can take your fight, he can cause you to get distracted enough to get pulled off of your assignment. Glory to God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. And so, I gotta leave you here today because my time is over. But what you gotta understand is that is good. what you gotta understand in this point of David's life uh, is that sin has a spiral. Sin has a spiral, and so what started off with a look, it started off with a look. You know, David would have been fine if he had left it at the look. But after he left it at the look, he, the look turned into a stare, and then the stare turned into an inquiry. And then the inquiry turned into an imagination. Yep, yep. I wonder if I could. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and then after the inquiry turned into an imagination, uh, the imagination to turn, to turn into a desire. Oh, uh, yeah, and then the desire turned into a lust. Uh, and then the lust turned into, I might as well go on and just do it now. I didn't come this far. I might as well just get into it. I didn't thought about it this long. I believe I can 
because other people can touch stuff and get away unseemingly. Other folk can do the same thing that you're about to do and seem like they get away with it. But when an anointed person puts their hands on the thing that God said, do not touch, oh, you got to understand that God will not allow his anointed child to get away with everything. Yes, Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. I am anointed. I am anointed. So I can't touch what other people touch. I can't do what other people do. Hallelujah. And so here it is in my closing today. We understand what then. We look at all of these things David went through. All of these things that David went through. What separated David for God to say that he was a man after his own heart? What was it about David that God delighted in. Hallelujah. Mm. What was it about him? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you today. And then the Lord is going to minister to us in this place. Psalm 63, 1 and 8. Psalm 63, 1 and 8. And it says, this is, this is, this is the makeup of David's mindset. It's the makeup of his heart. It's the makeup of a worshiper. Psalm 63 says, Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this parched and weary land where no water is. I have seen you in your sanctuary. And I have gazed upon your power and your glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feasts. I will praise you with songs of joy. I will lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Because you are my helper, I will sing of, for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. It was because David was such a worshiper. Hallelujah. It was because he was such a praiser. It was because he longed after God more than any other thing. He longed after God more than pleasure. He longed after God more than uh, uh, applause from people. He longed after God more than anything is what made David a man after God's own heart. And the next thing was Psalms 51. I want to show you what made David different. Come on, musicians. I want you to get ready uh, because we're getting ready to get out of here. Psalms 51, verses 1 through 12. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion. Blot out the stain of my sin. Wash me and clean me from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. Come on. This is somebody. This is for somebody. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in whatever you say. Your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. He says this prayer. He says, purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Give back to me my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't let, don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Here it is. Here is the prayer. He says, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Come on, I came to let somebody know in this place. Oh, glory to God that in the midst of your flaws, in the midst of your failures, in the midst of everything, every letdown, every failure, even some scandals that you've been through yourself, God said, 
from the other kings of Israel. Watch this. The other kings of Israel, look at the history. They turned their hearts to idolatry. But David kept his heart pursuing after God. He said, I'm far from perfect, but I will never stop pursuing the one that is perfect. Yes, Lord. He, he, he learned how in spite of what he was going through and in spite of his issues, he didn't run away from God. He kept running towards him. Because David's heart ever chased after God, because David's heart ever longed after God, the Lord blessed him. And I came to preach to some people that you think that your issues have disqualified you. You think that there's no way that God can use you because of some things going on in your life. And today, I just want to let you know that you are God's anointed. You are God's called. And if you would keep your heart pursuing after the one who is pursuing you, if you would live in that place, in that space of worship, that place, in that space of repentance, he says, I will call you a man after a man or a woman after my own heart. I'm through. Let us pursue him. Let us pursue him with everything in us. Let us pursue him with everything in us. Every ounce of strength. Every ounce of strength. Everything I got. Hallelujah. And this is for somebody. Somebody you've been giving God half, half of yourself. Today is the day for you to give him all. You've been locking him out from portions and areas of your life that you are unwilling to turn over to him. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Today the Lord says, I require all or nothing. I hear the spirit of the Lord say, I require all or nothing. I require all or nothing. I can deal with your issues. I can deal with your flaws. I can deal with your failures. I can deal with your mess ups. But you got to understand that it's all or nothing in this season. I did not just come for a portion of your heart. I didn't come for a portion of your mind. I didn't come for a portion of your ability. But he said that you will have this testimony that I will love the Lord.
chase after the hill. It's hard being anointed. Issues. God bless you. Till next time.